Hello, everybody. Today, Shell won on appeal in a lawsuit that Greenpeace and Environmental Defense filed against them. And this is very important news. And why this is important, I'm going to show you in this video. So first, what's going on? Environmental NGOs lose an appeal in lawsuit against Shell. The initial court ruling basically said that uh, Shell had to cut its emissions by 45% by 2030, and this was uh, this included scope 3 emissions, and scope 3 emissions are basically the emissions by customers when they use the fuel that they buy from Shell. Now, this lawsuit was basically a landmark win for the environmental NGOs because this was the first time an individual company was held accountable to the Paris Agreement goals. Now, on appeal, Shell has won this lawsuit again. Basically, the court said that Shell has the autonomy to determine how it reduce its, its own emissions and there are no specific mandates imposed on Shell for emission reductions. Now, the news you can also read over here at The Guardian. There's also a lot of Dutch news. Why is this relevant? Because, you know, fossil fuels, we use it for practically anything, right? Anything that you see, anything that you do involves some kind of fossil fuels. Now, we can reduce the use of fossil fuels Electrification is one of the things that might help, but it could also help if we could get sustainable fuels. Uh, the electrification, some people think that that is, you know, the high watermark. That's actually what we should do. According to some people, uh, they say if only we build a lot of renewables and then we electrify everything, we buy EVs and we do everything electrical in our houses and our factories become electrified, then everything will be all right. But that's just much, much, much too simplistic and naive. Um, and, and in order to get to a real transition, something that we are not even trying at this moment, uh, we need more dedication, money, energy, and intelligence. We need to become much more intelligent about energy transitions because what we are doing right now basically doesn't cut it. So how many annual carbon emissions are we talking about? We're talking about Shell again, right? So I've highlighted a couple of countries in red. This might be shocking to you, but if you look at the scope three emissions from Shell, uh, which I've highlighted in pink, I hope that you, that you can read it, that's 1.63 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. And that's really a lot. Just by comparison, right? Indonesia emits roughly two gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year. Russia, 2.3 gigatons. Brazil, 2.7 gigatons. India, 4.7 gigatons. The United States of America, 5.7 gigatons. And China, 7.5 gigatons. So all the emissions from all the fossil fuels that shall sold to their users, if you combine all of them, that's equivalent to a very large country on Earth. Now, the worldwide figure for emissions is roughly 37.4 gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year. The sources, I've, uh, I've mentioned them down below, worldemission.io, shell.com, and Statista. So, the scope one and two emissions, they are only measured in the megaton. So that's a factor of 1,000 less than the scope 3 emissions. So if, for instance, the court today had ruled that they needed to reduce 45% of their scope 3 emissions, that would be, that would constitute a huge problem. What would happen is we would force Shell to reduce their output of fossil fuels, but the demand would still be there, right? You don't discourage the demand. What would happen in this case is that British Petroleum and Esso and all those other fossil fuel companies would simply take over where Shell basically left. So this would not have been a solution to all the emissions on this planet. These, this would even not even be a solution for the emissions you know, that we have from driving cars around, from flying. Uh, I mean, the demand would still be there and the supply would simply come from another company. So I do think that this uh, this whole 
uh, lawsuit was simplistic and naive because it was it, it would target one of the largest fossil fuel suppliers, but it really wouldn't do anything to curb the demand. And if we look at what is happening to the fossil fuel industry, fossil fuels and the usage thereof is still on the rise. Now, this uh, our world in data graph goes up to 2023, but I'm willing to bet that if we get the next graph for 2024, that we will still see an increase. Personally, I do think that CO2 emissions are a problem. I'm not going to tell you in this video why I think those are a problem. If you want to know something about this issue, please go and look at Dr. James Hansen's website, for instance. He has a lot of valuable information where you can learn more. I'm, I'm going to make sure that a link is in the description below. Now, the problem of these environmental NGOs is that they have a hyper focus on the existential threat that is called climate change, right? So the problem with these environmental NGOs is that they have idealized solutions. Most of them talk about uh, only using wind and solar and some geothermal and maybe some hydro. And we all should start driving electric vehicles. We all should start electrifying our homes. Everybody should stop eating meat. There, there is this, this whole gamut of ideal solutions against climate change. But the problem is that these are not really solutions, not at the scale that we are deploying them today, not at the pace at which we are deploying them today. Plus, the main problem is that they are trying to force everybody to accept these solutions. So they believe that anything should be done to eliminate the threat they want to force change through the judicial system, as we can see with this lawsuit. But they also want to force change through social coercion. So they, they, they for instance, they, they glue themselves to the road. Uh, they throw soup cans at pictures. Uh, they, they blame flying. They blame large cars. They, they try to blame holidays. It, it's, it's all one big coercion machine. They don't account for the socioeconomically accepted middle road. So the, the basic problem with this lawsuit is that Shell isn't in the end use transition business, right? They are not selling EVs. They're not selling synthetic fuels. It is in the selling fuel business. And the issue is if the demand shifts, then Shell will shift with it. So if there become if a demand for sustainable fuels would emerge, then Shell would start selling sustainable fuels. The bigger the demand for sustainable fuels becomes, the more sustainable fuels they will produce. It's the exact same mechanism as which is going on right now. The more demand for fossil fuels there are, the more fossil fuels Shell will produce. It's that simple. And I believe that this lawsuit and Shell is basically the wrong place to start change. Change starts when the demand changes. So where does real change start? The only successful transition is the one that doesn't require people to change their life. The only successful transition is the one that doesn't rely on discouraging use, but encouraging change. This is very important because this is... This is a paradigm that a lot of people simply don't get. They think that, oh, if we make fossil fuels more expensive, then we will use less fossil fuels. And in the end, uh, the EV will become cheaper and everybody will start driving EVs. And then the fossil fuel industry will stop to exist. That's not going to happen. First of all, people can't afford EVs. You know, loads of people can have, afford EVs, but let's say that at least 50% of all the people living in Germany or living in Europe can't afford to buy a new EV. I, I think that is a reasonable assertion given the fact that EV sales aren't as big as they, they should be if we are on, a, on the road of eliminating fossil fuel internal combustion engine cars. It's not happening at this moment. So... The EVs are not cheap enough, which means that the the the, the fossil fuel car, the, the internal combustion engine car that runs on fossil fuels still is needed by, you know, 80 or even 90 percent of all Europeans, of all people in the United States and in the rest of the world. So if you would then make 
fossil fuels increasingly more expensive, what is going to happen is that the usage of fossil fuels, though it would be curbed a little bit, it would not basically stop being used because people need to move around. People need their cars to do the groceries. People need their cars to get to work. We need cars. We need personal transportation. If you live in a big city, then maybe you can do it with the bus or the metro or the train. But if, you know, most countries aren't as urbanized as we would like them to be, which means that the availability of fossil fuels to drive around with your simple car is essential. So what would my path look like, right? I would stop discouraging people from using fossil fuels because that's not going to work. What we could do is we could start with the production of synthetic fuels, which are a direct replacement of fossil fuels, but don't require you to buy an expensive EV. You can still drive around with your 5,000 euro second hand car, but the sustainable fuel would be loads better than the fossil fuel that you burn. But in order to make these fuels, you need a lot of energy because extracting energy from the ground in the form of oil is easy. Extracting carbon atoms and extracting hydrogen atoms from the air, from the sea, from biomass is much harder. And then turning those atoms into fuels is also much harder. So first we need very cheap nuclear energy. Without very cheap nuclear energy, we don't even have to try, try to start. So I would basically have a ruthless focus on making nuclear cheaper and making us better and more, more able to deploy these new nuclear power plants faster. And I mean any nuclear power plant, lye water reactors, molten salt reactors, liquid metal, fast breeder reactors, pebble bed reactors, anything really. Personally, I don't care. I just want cheap nuclear. So that, will, that would be my key focus. And then I would encourage the fossil fuel companies to transition from extracting fossil fuels to basically creating synthetic fuels. They do have the infrastructure, right? You don't need to overhaul the entire infrastructure. What you do need to do is you need to uh, change from having a refinery to having a synthetic fuel production facility. That's the only change that need to, needs to happen. But all the rest, the entire infrastructure that is attached to this, to this refinery system, can remain the same as long as the fuels are roughly the same that you put into, into them. You can make synthetic diesels and you can also make synthetic ethanol, you can make methanol, you can make loads of synthetic hydrocarbons that, that, that you can use in your car. So that would be my key focus. And with that, you've reached the end of this video. Please, if you liked the video, leave a like and subscribe to the channel. If you learned anything new, please let me know in the comments down below what you think about this subject. So thank you all for watching and may the strong force be with you. Bye-bye.